Hello everyone, and welcome back to track three, and indeed the final part of this turntable series. Track three, uh, named after one of the songs and indeed one of the people who got me into wanting to play guitar, Purple Haze. 46% uh, blended whiskey again, with a rather interesting collection of things. Very different colour to the other two we've tried. And here is that little cast breakdown again. again. I've only just realised that might actually be backwards for all of you. Anyway, I'll tell you. In descending order again, we have 42% of this is Craig Ellicke from an Oloroso Sherry Butt. 44% of it, oh, I've done that wrong already, I've started with a 42. 44% of this uh, is from Balmenic in a Pedro Jimenez Sherry Puncheon. And then 14% is from Invergordon grain whiskey in X sherry and indeed that is the end of our turntable series um, again just kind of want to commend them for this beautiful little booklet I wish all blended whiskey companies did stuff like this because the breakdown the color schemes this is pretty cool like I know every batch of blended whiskey is vaguely different due to whatever stock is available um, but to republish a small publication like that that goes in a book to that goes in a box with your whiskey just to say hey just so you know in this batch there's this stuff That'd be pretty fun. Um, I know Compass Box do that and a few other people if you go onto their website. But it's nice that these guys have it with it. Um, indeed, I hope uh, it's on the back of the boxes and the full size bottles too. But we are dealing with all sherry here, folks. Sherry Seat Single Malts from Craig Ellicke and Balmenic. Can't think of two more polar opposite Speyside whiskey distilleries than those. And some Invergordon as well, uh, but also from a sherry cask. Grain whiskey and sherry casks. Not the most common thing, but indeed it does happen. Tried a few of them. Some of them are very, very strange. Some of them are very excellent. But this, uh, having tried these samples a little bit before, is probably my favorite of all of them. And that comes from someone who, in his own words, falls in and out of love with sherry a lot. Um, sherry single malts obviously have their place, but I think when you nail sherry very well in blended whiskey, it just adds this beautiful accent onto all the different flavors you can get from there. Now, before we dive into that, Craig Ellicke, a Speyside distillery that's different in all the best ways possible. Uh, worms up condensers, very old school approach to things, slightly peated spirit, um, typically comes across as more sort of salty, meaty, sometimes even like fatty, like deli meats. Balmenic. Um, Balmenic, I believe, is owned by the folks who own Bal Blair and Old Pulteney, so that'd be Inverhouse Distillers. I suppose Balmenic's actually more famous for making Kurun Gin than it is whiskey at the minute, but they indeed provide a blend, a malt for blending stock for things like Hanky Bannister. I think that's still part of Inverhouse's line. Um, and the older releases of Hanky Bannister are genuinely quite impressive. They're 21 year olds, delicious. And then Invergordon, which is owned by White and Mackay. Um, should have probably given this information many videos ago, but yeah, the only northern full single grain distillery Huge facility tens of millions of liters of whiskey a year But all of this matured in sherry and I think it's only the Balmenic which is in Pedro Jimenez So yeah, the Craig Ellicke states Oloroso, the Balmenic states Pedro Jimenez The Invergordon just says sherry and Typically from my knowledge of whiskey if it just says sherry, it's probably just Oloroso um, but that's a bit of information that we don't have in terms of full detail. But yeah, stunning colour on this. Um, I've got the rest of the samples just here. So that's that's track three in the glass versus track two in the bottle. And if I can get track one out of this little box. Yeah, so we're dealing with quite a colour difference already. No virgin oak at all. Sometimes sherry just hits right, you know. It is impossible to get away from the Craig Gallagher in this, in, but in all the good ways, much like with Trap 2 and Kalila, there's just that dense, rich saltiness to it. It's honestly, the, the smell of this thing just reminds me of like really good casks of single barrel Bonner Harvin that I've had. Chocolate orange, saltiness, denseness, sweetness. But typically a little bit cheaper. Not as high strength as well, but you know, a little bit cheaper. Okay. 
quite interesting to see what Barmanic are up to these days. Um, I don't think there's ever... Oh no, maybe there was an official bottle. Didn't Balmenic used to be a flora and fauna bottle? Didn't Diageo used to own that at some point? Or am I making that up? Am I getting that confused with like Speyburn and Aberfeldy? Maybe I am. Or is it Altmore? I think it was both of them actually. Um, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen an official bottle of Balmenic ever. I tried some wonderful indie stuff and it was always just exceptionally honeyed. Like really fruity, apple-y and honeyed. That's like always been Balmenic's thing. There is a slight kind of trebly orchid fruit top note coming from this. It's reading like just like a red, like red stuff, like red apple, um, slightly strawberry like. But you've just got the weight of this over the top Craig Ellicky. Even if you're a Sherry fan, that's going to divide most of you. So up front, chocolate, raisin, not quite Christmassy stuff. Raisin, I suppose, is kind of Christmassy. But yeah, chocolate, raisin. It starts off really sweet. You get that kind of milk chocolate creaminess and it moves into like more bitter dark chocolate. But through all of that, even through Pedro Jimenez and what I assume are two different Oloroso casks, we have just this dense, I've used that word a lot, but rich, salty, fatty, oily feel. Which in, a lot, in all honesty reminds me of Bonner Half and 12 cash strength, but without being as strong and a little bit cheaper. Um, so that's quite interesting in itself. The finish, we'll get to the sort of a few other points in a minute, but the finish is where the Balmenic actually does come through. Now, Invergordon is just grain whiskey. Again, I probably should have done all this in track one, but grain whiskey is distilled to a significantly higher alcohol level, and it's distilled through a continuous still, or a column still, or a coffee still. Um, many different names for it. They're all, they are all slight. Column stills and coffee stills are slightly different, but essentially it's continuous distillation. And with that, you tend to strip more flavor out of a product. So trying to pick out the grain whiskies in these blends is gonna be quite hard to do. It's just gonna come across as sweetness more than anything. But you do get the Balmenic. You do get these kind of honeyed red apple plum-like notes, but you know, sherry cask plum flavors, pretty typical. Um, but there is this nice kind of bright, fruity finish to it, considering how dominant the Craig Ellicky is on this. But at the same time, even with all those flavours, it's actually quite an easy drink. If you again, are a blended whiskey fan, or if you're a malt fan who likes blends, or if you're a bourbon fan who likes blended whiskey, or if you want to get into a blend. Yes, these are at a higher price point. They're not that much different in price point to some very sort of, not sought after, but like praised compass box items. And they have as interesting cast selection, they're at a similar alcohol percentage. Uh, compass box products don't have an age statement on them, or most of them don't anyway. Uh, they aren't limited editions. But you can go on the website and find out, indeed, I've actually not been onto Turntable's website, so you could actually find the age statements maybe on there, or even email them. But if you are a fan of that style, and I know a lot of compass boxes are also blends and blended malts and blended grain, this stuff is quite good. Like, this, this by far and away will get a lot of people into that product. Not necessarily into blended whiskey, but certainly into this. Because this is quite delicious. I could sit here and drink quite a lot of this all night.
that in the most beautiful essence of it is a product that you can just pop, pour, and not really have to think about because it's given you all this intense flavour. But at the same time it's got such a light finish. Big up front, a little bit smaller towards the back. Almost like Purple Haze the Tune. Big dissonant guitar at the start and then you get that slow fade out as he's kind of wailing on his guitar solo. But yeah, a very, very interesting style. I think I gave track one and track two both seven and a half, so I'm going to give this one an eight. It is a much more interesting style. If you are a fan of things like Compass Box, uh, who else makes really cool blended malt whiskies? If you're a fan of Johnny Walker 15 year old and you've always wanted that to be richer, this could be a ticket for you. Uh, it's a little bit more money again, it's like 15 pounds more expensive, but again, could be a way to go. Wonderfully dry finish to it as well. And I just realized I didn't finish a point. My brain is running at a million miles an hour today. Um, why it would divide sherry drinkers. And I've just mentioned that dryness, right? There is some sulfury notes in this, but they're sulfury to a point where it's only coming across as some very soft drying of the sides of the tongue, which you would get from an, an equivalent sherry cask single malt just at cask strength, really. Um, so yeah, slight sulfuriness running through it, but nothing that you would like properly put you off. Um, I'm trying to think of like particularly sulfury examples of whiskey. Um, I had a batch of Glendronach 12 a couple of years ago, which was so sulfury, it was crazy. I think it was one of the first that Rachel Barry put out. Um, really fun, quite re memorable. Uh, re memorable, quite memorable actually. Um, it had like a Campbelltown-y thing to it in terms of funk. It was quite fun. Um, Glen Farkless always comes across as quite sulfury to me, but I'm, I'm not, a, as I've said many times before, I'm not the biggest Glen Farkless fan. Um, some Glendronach, other Glendronachs as a whole, 21s have. But yeah, it's not like that. Um, it just comes across as this soft little drying at the sides of your tongue. But overall, I'm going to give that an 8 out of 10. Um, thank you all for sticking with me through this turntable series. It's been quite interesting. Um, I think it's getting to that time of year now where everyone starts sending whiskey people all sorts of stuff. Um, but in all honesty, of all the blended whiskies I've tried that I've been sent, these are some of the funnest. And yeah, 60 quid, it's not a price point that everyone's going to want to pay, but I think if you just want something where they're being as transparent as they can based on a company which isn't actually a distillery, uh, they're just sourcing stock, I think it is quite a nice thing to do. But um, yeah, if any of those whiskies have interested you, they are for sale. Um, I'm not an affiliate or anything, so by means you're going to have to go and find them for sale somewhere yourself. But overall, uh, very tasty whiskies, very fun, uh, quite inventive to a degree, and it's nice to see some different cask options being highlighted uh, in a blended product, and indeed technically a limited edition product that doesn't cost the world. And I'm talking about things like Diageo special releases and stuff like that. Um, but yes, that's track three, Purple Haze. Give it an 8 out of 10. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you all next week. Cheers.